matter of survival, baby, better watch your back. There is no, no answer. Hello, all my peculiars. No, welcome, no welcome answer. to our show. Very exciting to have you here on our very first Peculiar Book Club date. And we have the most amazing guest joining us here tonight. So Davey and I are really, really excited to have you with us in our inaugural event. We're going to have a lot of fun tonight, chances to win more prizes. Davey, do you want to say hello? Absolutely. Thank you, Brandy. Thanks for having me here to joining you on this weird, peculiar show. I'm very excited for all the fun conversations we're going to have. The interesting books that I've already gotten to start reading and listening to. And uh, I'm going to bring a little bit of my weird to the show. So I very much have a love of pop culture and movies and TV. So we're going to see some weird connections and, and ways that these themes tie in across pop culture. Then we're also going to have a little quiz for Mary to see how well she knows cadavers. That's right. It's a little bit of a stump the author kind of event here tonight. Um, I'm already seeing that you guys have fantastic questions, including where I got the snakeskin top. You got a thrift store hunt for things like this. Um, but I do right now, for all of you I know are waiting for this, want to introduce Mary Roach. Thank you so much for coming to join us. Thank you. It's really great to be here. I am so honored to be the inaugural guest, Peculiar. Yay! 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 Fantastic. Anyway. I, see, I froze for a minute. Sorry. <laughs> I froze. But I want to ask a couple of questions about what's behind you because you've got some great book it almost looks like we're in the same room like we just this is just a really long bookstore that travels from ohio all the way to california um but i happen to know you have a an interesting and very peculiar item on your shelf and it's red and i wondered if you could say if you were uh, yeah i will actually get it uh yes this is Actually, a th um, this is made with a 3D printer. It is an, a, a human rectum. And this was a gift to me. I was doing a talk in Syracuse. Ooh, it's a little dusty. I hate when your <laughs> rectum gets dusty. Um, but anyway, I don't know whose rectum it is. I'm not sure. Uh, but um, and this is no doubt a HEPA violation of some kind, except for <laughs> or her name. Um, but I think it's pretty awesome. It's one of my prized possessions. The guy just said he's got a 3D printer and I think it was made from somebody's uh, MRI, CD. Oh my. I don't know. Anyway, that's my no, rectum. I, I know no one else in the world who has a 3D printed rectum on their bookshelf. So I just, I was really excited to share that with all of you. I think the strangest thing on my bookshelf might be this. It is a very small coffin. Uh, it's like mouse sized coffin. Um, I was at an event and a, a strange man in a hat handed this to me and it turns out on the inside to be a retelling of a telltale heart from the perspective of a cat um and, so and, i like you know gifts from strange men sometimes i guess so. and, uh, there is no cat there is no cat in a telltale heart <laughs> so that there is in his world in so his, well that's yeah that's pretty that's right up there with a red 3D printed rectum. <laughs> um, so I, one of the things I'm so excited about is, of course, Stiff. Stiff is, um, it's legend, really. And I'm excited that we're, that is the book we're going to be talking about tonight. There's lots of discussion questions. I know you have some updates for us because you, you're revisiting it for a, a re-release. Yes. Um, yes. But, I, but I also, uh, I wanted to honor that moment by crafting um, a very special cocktail for your book. So this book themed cocktail thing, thing, where's my cocktail? Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, thing. This is called One Stiff Drink. And all of you should have the recipe. Uh, and I, I, I wanted to say a few words about that. So gin, because I feel like sometimes we need to steal our nerves for these peculiar events. Uh, Midori to give it that green hue, a little absinthe, that antiseptic feel. And then some peeled green grapes a little bit like eyeballs. So I do hope that all of you were able to uh, imbibe something similar, something similarly green, 
uh, and corpse like for one stiff drink for Mary Roach's event tonight. Here's to you, Mary. I wish I could hand it through the screen. Yeah, that's fun. It's fantastic. Sadly, I didn't have any absinthe or majority, and I had planned to run out and get some, but um, the day got ahead of me. So I look longingly at <laughs> your stiff drink. My which stiff um, drink. I'm going to be sharing that make as I make the rounds when I, the re release of the book comes out. Oh, yes. Yes, it's great. With it's your, absolutely. With your permission. Because meant to be shared, meant to, in your yeah. honor. We should have, um, I should have done that on the original book tour. God damn it. I, <laughs> where was I then? <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you just one quick question from myself, and then really we're going to get right into it with the book club discussion, inviting the questions from our audience. But the question I had is, yes. what, what drove you to write Stiff? It, it's one of my favorites, but what brought you to this place? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, this is this is something that came about because I have a habit of wandering around the far reaches of the stacks of libraries, in particular, medic. This was a medical school library at UCSF, and I was in the basement where no one goes. It's got the you know stacks where you have to crank the thing in order to get. Mm. It. Yeah. Um, so, I, and I just like to wander around and and see what's there. And this was where they keep all the old books that are out of date and that no. Of no sane medical student would ever <laughs> need. I'm always the only person down there. And there was this whole row of um, bound journals. Um, and they were, it was the proceedings of the STAP car crash conference. And I took one down <laughs> and it was, um, it, this was, the, they're from this mostly the, the 1960s, which was the beginning of automotive safety research. And so they, it was uh, this field of research called impact tolerance, which is how much can the human body withstand and how much is it getting in a crash? And can we design a crash test dummy? You know, can we figure out how wow. to create a, a, an anthropomorphic dummy to give us that information? But before they did the dummies, they were live humans who would get on a crash sled like up to about 30 miles an hour and just like their eyeballs would pop out and they'd get banged around. Oh. <laughs> uh, anyway, but at a certain point they're like, you know, we need those guys who don't feel anything. We need cadavers to do this work, to see like, you know, what happens at 30 miles, 40, 50 miles an hour, you know, if the steering wheel hits your chest or if, you know, the your face goes through the windshield, et cetera. Mm. And I was kind of astounded. I'd never heard of this field. I had never, I mean, that whole, I, I like to step inside universes that I've never heard about. So uh, I was kind of fixated on the STAP car crash conference proceedings. I wrote a column about some of the work for uh, salon.com where I had a column at that time and an agent saw it and said, you should think about writing a book. And I was like, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> like, who goes into a bookstore and goes like, Oh, look at all these new nonfiction books. Let's see which one. Oh, the one about the cadavers. That's what I'm going to buy. Like that. Well, you're, you know, I got to say, you're that's your audience tonight. Um, so <laughs> exactly. It's, it's, we, we've got a couple a couple questions already coming in, and I'm going to ask them slightly out of order. One of them, several of them, have to do with Dr. Oz. But before we get there, since you were talking about just starting out, one of the questions. Uh, whoops, I've lost it again. There, Davy, help me out here. Uh, you guys are fast typers. Uh, C Lion seven seven seven. How do you support yourself when you're starting out? Also, how do you convince people to let you hang with dead people? And I think that's a good question. <laughs> that's a really good question. I'm going to answer that one first. Um, it was my first book, so I was an unknown, and that was tough. I got a lot of a lot of people didn't write back. A lot of, a lot of ignored emails. Um, I am a persistent person. I just thought, okay. I'll move on to someone else. Um, and uh, uh, the, but the way I can the way I convince people mostly is just to kind of break down when someone says no, um, to try to find out well what does no mean? No, does no mean I don't trust you? I don't know what you're going to do. Right. No, like in which case there's a lot you can do. You can say you know I can let you fact check the chapter. Um, I can put you in touch with other people I've spoken to in the past who can you know vouch that I'm not insane and horrible. Um, you just, uh, you, you know, kind of make the situation more comfortable for them. I mean, you could, could have a research, you, people who do that are not eager to have a spotlight shined on what they're right. doing <laughs> for the most part. So it was a yeah. challenge, it was definitely a challenge. 
Uh, it just, um, I would move, sometimes just accept that this person wasn't going to participate. Um, right. Yeah. So that was hard. Yeah. Right, a so a little bit of work goes into that, huh? Um, we had a couple other people uh, just popping in here, and they're fast typers. Um, Sarah McMullen said, imagine being replaced by a dead body. And Anne said, I mean, we all build, will be eventually. It's too true. Um, Susie said, uh, in Stiff, you had not gotten to, uh, in Stiff, he's not. So she's referring back to, to Oz again. So many questions about Dr. Oz. Maybe we better just, just hop in on there. Sure. That was, that was so weird because when I wrote this book, I mean, when I was writing it, researching it around 2000, 2001, 2002, uh, uh, Mehmet Oz was a heart transplant surgeon mm -hmm. and that's it. <laughs> had How had times have changed. Dr. Oz. I mean, he was a Dr. Oz, but um, so he was just, uh, um, I don't even remember how I stumbled onto him, but he was, um, he, he, he seems like a completely uh, uh, different person to me. The one that, the, the person that I met when I wrote the book versus um, the person that I, I've been on his show for Gulp. I went on the Dr. Oz show. I don't, I doubt any of you have seen this. You're probably not watchers of the Dr. Oz show, but he was very, uh, uh, just like a, I don't think he remembered me for one thing, but he was, but um, uh, just completely, I don't know what happened <laughs> to Dr. Oz. But anyway, <laughs> what did happen on the show that made me, uh, made me feel a little bit better was that his, his crew had, you know, there's a giant video screen on the wall, like wall sized, huge video screen. And they had made a graphic of a colon, which it had up there, and looking at it, all of a sudden this giant turd like, <laughs> and it's not um, meant to be funny. I mean, I started to laugh and then looked at. Sorry, oh. it's like, oh, sorry. This, is, this is educational. I'm really sorry. It's a giant turd. Anyway, it was a, it was pretty surreal. To I don't know. He he um, he went through some kind of personality shift. Um, and and also just have priorities and and value. Mm -hmm. and so so yeah, I almost wanted to when we you know we, we we did a epilogue for the book, and I I I was thinking should I include a Dr. Oz paragraph saying <laughs> we don't know what happened here. <laughs> Back then, I swear to you, he was not that guy. But I didn't you know I didn't I didn't put anything in about him. Um. Chelsea Hunt said uh, that Gulp is her favorite and that her wife hates when she talks to her about fistulas. Um, I, I, have, I have a couple questions which are sort of related. Uh, Elizabeth Witten says, what's your favorite part of being an author, the research or the writing? And just a little bit further down, uh, we have Anne asking, what was your favorite chapter to write and why? And I feel like those are kind of related and maybe you could sort of address those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, the, I, I enjoy the writing, but only if the research went well. If the research goes well and I found some place to go that is absolutely amazing or I'm in some situation that I know is going to be fun to write up, then the writing is a joy. So they're so interconnected <clears throat> that it's hard to say. I can't like one without the other, which sounds like some horrible song lyric. Um, horse, what's that? Love and marriage. Never mind. <laughs> Um, writing and research. So, um, yeah, I, I only like the writing if the research went well, and if the research mm. went well, I love it. Um, right. Uh, often, neither one goes well, and I hate them both. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. No, I, I, I feel yeah. that. Um, um, so, I, I'm just trying to get to people who haven't had a chance to ask questions yet, and you guys, I know I'm behind. Sorry. Um, <laughs> There's uh, several questions about what to do with remains. So, for instance, Kristen asks, uh, if if human composting is is legal now, should I do it? And much much earlier, we had a question. Uh, I've lost track of it now. About um, did, has it changed your plans about what you want to do after death? And I thought maybe you could address both of those for us. Yeah, sure. Um, compo yeah, yeah, human. Oh, well done. Natural organic reduction. I was corrected by uh, somebody when I, I said comp. They said, you know, we don't really say composting. We say natural <laughs> reduction. Anyway, yeah. Uh, um, Absolutely. Why not? I mean, it's a pretty cool operation they have up there. Uh, um, it's a um, giant vessel and it, it's um, they put a lot of hay and organic matter and it, it turns you don't you're not broken into small pieces like the 
people in Sweden had imagined doing, breaking the, shaking the body apart or using ultrasound and they never got that going. They just, there was uh, lots of problems there. But uh, this apparently works. And then you get this, you know, this material that you can grow a plant with or do something, you know, you can use it as fertilizer, which seems really nice. And I can say that that is, <laughs> I got a, lo a, a lot of feedback from people saying that that's what they would like to do. How can they find out more about it? That and surprisingly the body farm, people seem to really want to go rot in a field. <laughs> I, that's fascinating. Um, I, uh, I was asked to donate my brain to science by my neurologist, which might be a sort of compliment from a neurologist. I'm not really sure um, how to take it, frankly. Um, so I have thought about donating my body to science. Um, but uh, what about yourself? Has it changed your, have you, have you thought about doing any of these things? Yeah, you know what, I have the, I, I still, I have the papers that I do actually have the UCSF. I've been in touch with the willed body people at UCSF. And really I sort of, I, because I wrote this book, and I'm so, I'm, my personality is everything so connected to it. I, f I feel like it really behooves me to donate myself to, to my local medical school. But I have to say, I, I, I still have the image of me on the slab. And, and, you know, I know what cadavers look like. And it's not, right. it's not very pretty. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to look like shit. I'm going to be. <laughs> Smell. And it's like, and I, I know the, the proper attitude is who cares, you know, who cares? Right, right. Yeah. I don't know though. I mean, somebody might be really excited to get your body. Like, oh my, you guys, we have Mary Roach. Well, what, I'm, what I said in, in the epilogue for the new edition of Stiff, um, I actually have a letter that I've written that I will put in the file. So uh, the students who get my body will have this little letter from me. So they'll, um, they'll pretty much know it's me. That's fantastic. Yeah. No, um, Teclin says Stiff was assigned in AP bio class mm -hmm. and your books are, are just their favorite. Um, and several other people have been asking about updates uh, on the new book. There's been two or three questions that have come along here. I'm just double checking uh, what I could, um, the names are hard for me to find. I don't know if Davey can, can pull them out, but um, really excited people are to hear about what's changed as yeah. you're revisiting this topic. What's different? Right, right. Well, um, I've updated. Um, well, there were some things that happened, you know, in terms of anatomy labs, you know, so starting with the most common thing that people end up doing um, during COVID, it basically went virtual. And there's a lot of computerized programs that have gotten really good. They're very expensive, but they're kind of, you know, some of them is like it's a tabletop and you can move through the body. Um, but if you talk to anatomy professors, they're kind of like, yeah, it's a great adjunct, but it doesn't take the place of actually taking a body apart piece by piece, yeah. physically doing it. It's also kind of a rite of passage. Um, students don't like to have it taken away. Um, right. So uh, it it is still being done, uh, that you're still gonna see cadavers in anatomy labs, I'm happy to say. Uh, I mean, I, I, I mean, the COVID has pushed it in a direction. There may be anatomy right. departments that say, you know what, this is so much less hassle and less expense. We're going to keep doing it. Um, but there was, there were some schools that did that, and they saw board scores drop. So mm -hmm. um, that'll be the real test. So that's been going on. Um, there was one school that, um, I mean, there's a in Stiff. I talk about a memorial service that uh, that then that's a really nice. Um, mm -hmm right that happens where the um the families of the cadaver that the, you know, the, right. the cadavers the families get together with the students and there and there's no body there obviously there's no <laughs> remains it's no open casket <laughs> but um, but one school now and i don't know if this will catch on but it's it's before the class the, stu the students meet the family of the actual body they are going to dissect beforehand yeah beforehand the actual wow. not just you know, the family gets thanked by the students in general. It's here's the people whose loved one you are going to dissect, which I thought, and it's been a really popular uh, program and has inspired some people to donate. Uh, so it's pretty, that's pretty cool. It's pretty radical. That's very cool. Mm. Yeah. Um, Molly asks if anyone's ever changed their career uh, as a result of reading your book. <laughs> um, do you know, has anybody read your book and gone like, yes? This is a thing I want to do. I, I want to be a. Oh well, yeah, I actually get uh, at readings. Sometimes someone will come up to me and say, um, "I read, I read your book in high school, and that's why I decided to go to medical school, and now I'm an intern at so and so." Wow. Or somebody has gone into forensics um, because they read the book, and uh, that's that's always 
hugely gratifying to me when somebody That's decides cool. to either to teach science or to go into medicine. So it does happen. Yeah. I don't know if there's yeah. people discouraged. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, never mind. Didn't want to do that after all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's really funny. Uh, Sandy Levine asks um, that it's amazing the way you can take any topic and make it funny. Do you credit your incredible sense of humor to anyone or anything in particular? Uh, well, I have to say, Sandy, that that is actually not true. I cannot, most topics I cannot take and make funny. <laughs> I'm very good at choosing something that I can make funny. Um, it, it, there are some, there's things, most things, uh, this is, what can you do? It's pretty tough. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I think about you know my parents. My dad was my dad was kind of a storyteller. He was funny, but he was not funny in the same way. And my mom was a little, she's a little odd, but not. <laughs> yeah, so that my mom would. One time, my mom came up to me with a daddy long legs and goes, "Look, you can pull the legs off, and and they're." <laughs> I'm like, that's a really odd thing to show me. Um, but but uh, yeah, she, so she uh, but she I don't think of her as a terribly funny person. Um, mm. I don't know what happened? To me. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm, you belong at the peculiar book club. I feel like yeah, there yeah. might be reasons that you're here. Maybe, um, my, maybe my mother did too. But anyway, I I don't know. I don't Susie know. Asks, I want to go back. I know that there's a couple other updates in the new book, and uh, so Susie asks. Uh, so some of the ethics that were brought up in the book, like the practice. Uh, pelvic exams have made news in the past few years. Have you seen any change or stagnation in ethics since the book came out? Um, I haven't actually. Um, yeah, yeah. Actually, there's there's been changes in um, a lot of changes in mm -hmm. consent being more specific and more spelled out. In other words, if if you make a donation of your body to a university, um, you you are the forms are much more detailed. Like you're giving specific consent. Like, do you, are you okay um, being part of a study or being part of a text? You know, not that it's going to show your face, but there may be your pieces of you or your body being uh, ending up in a journal paper or a textbook or online. And so that right. is hugely important to get specific consent. Yeah. You just say, I give my body. Let's go. Go ahead. Do what you want. <laughs> I don't care. Um, now, uh, it's, it, it is way more specific. Yeah. And that's definitely been the case with us in particular, um, things where there's any kind of, um, like trauma research or, um, okay. well, uh, in, in grunt, my last book, I talked about, um, there's, there's a project to develop a crash test dummy for underbody blast, meaning if you're in an armored personnel carrier and you go over an IED and the whole, and it blows up. There are right. a tremendous number of injuries to the ankles, to the back, et cetera. And so um, they did. They needed to use cadavers to calibrate this particular kind of dummy. You couldn't use a frontal impact dummy. You couldn't use a side impact dummy. It's an underbody blast. You can't imagine the steps that they I mean, it was all the way to the Senate to get permission, very specific. Oh, okay, so, yeah. And say, are you okay with this? I mean, I saw that study. I mean, it's not like the body is blown into pieces it just like gets a bump <laughs> and it's only if you, like, right. small, you know i think it's probably the visual in your head more than anything else i suppose it's, it's, right exactly. it's the visual in your head um honestly uh way more pleasant visual than anything in an anatomy lab i mean you know that's where it I, is. I was inspired to know that uh, that heads were about the size of a roasting chicken. I, I found that that was a, an interesting point to, you know, good cocktail conversation. Speaking of being inspired, Maureen Chilko says that uh, while she wasn't inspired to go into anything medical from your books, your work inspires her to write. Um, which I think is cool. Uh, let's see here. Getting down to the, whoa, I skipped ahead. Sorry. Uh, oh, nasty man, try. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. So many, so many good people here. Um, several people, Shy Walker talking about being in the middle of genetics class when everything shut down due to COVID. Uh, and then a lot of other people saying the similar thing that we've got these um, things have changed because of COVID. And I know death practices have probably changed because of COVID as well. Do you, do you have any, any words about that? Um, well, I do know. I have a, a friend who was a medical examiner, uh, in the city where I live. And she, when COVID hit, um, took a job in New Zealand. 
you know, um, that I think felt to her just too dangerous to have. I mean, me, I, I've been in the, I've been in the room with her when she's done her work, and it's like her head is in, she's like inside the body. She's very <laughs> cool. so she's really I'm, into her work. She's very into her work. So yeah, and and to be, uh, you know, dealing with so many um, bodies coming in with COVID, obviously not breathing, but uh, still. Um, it's a it's a very uh, hands on, shall we say, hands in occupation. So I think that's been um, th there's been uh, she wrote all kinds of protocols uh, before she left for dealing with with bodies uh, and also going into apartments. And I mean, everything had to be rethought. So, yeah. Right. Right. Wow. That's that's incredible. I've got a couple of comments rather than questions. And folks, I may have missed your question earlier because a lot came in at once. Feel free to rewrite them. Uh, in the text, if I haven't called on you, please do. Uh, Lilith Daly says, uh, stiff was my introduction to looking at death in a way that was positive, not gross or scary, but useful to learning about the human body. And thank you for that. And I think that that's, that's a big agree. I think death has become, um, we're a little divorced from it. I actually wrote a book called Death Summer Coat, which is, covers some similar issues. And yeah. uh, and that's not good for us. I mean, it's not good for, we've, we've yeah. learned that um, COVID has hit and we are really unprepared yes. to deal with death in our faces this way. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, um, you know, the book came. The book came out at a time when Six Feet Under had just come on the air, and CSI. So you turn on the TV, and suddenly there were bodies, dead bodies, yeah. on the slab everywhere. So the timing was good. There was kind of a breakdown of that taboo. Mm -hmm. uh, people's, people were allowed to feel curious, and they were allowed to ask questions, and they were allowed to get engaged in television shows and books that openly talked about it. And I think it was. Healthy. I mean, not everybody agreed. I got a review in England that said, "Stiff success in America is evidence of cultural decay." <laughs> Ow, <laughs> a little bit personal. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I do think, but I do think that books like this help us break into those conversations when we need to. Uh, Lisa Walker yeah. says, "I listened to your books. I was re-listening to Stiff, and my 21-year-old daughter was unfortunate enough to be in the car uh, during the EV chapter, and she said, I'm putting on my headphones now. Sorry um, for that. <laughs> uh, I love it. Um, but it's true. It, it, it is something that makes people really, really comfortable. I just skipped ahead again. Sorry, guys. This chat function is y'all just typing all kinds of stuff. You're doing a great thing. Um, it feels like, you know, as close as you can get to a book club, you know, it's- Yeah, uh, I know, it's great. Yeah. Um, lots of people know who Dr. Judy is and they're all like, yay! Um, pathology <laughs> expert is on here yay. saying yes. hi from New Zealand. <laughs> uh, I, someone else says, um, uh, let's see. I love how you insert yourself into the story, which isn't traditional science writing. Did you get any pushback on that? And I, I had this question as well, because I know um, I come from an academic world where it's like you never put yourself in the book. And I frequently sort of pop up accidentally, like I'm not there. And then I'm like, hi, I'm here. So, um, yeah, I'd love to hear more about that, too. Um, I have gotten pushback in the past for, uh, from um magazines uh you know each mag each publication has their own style and their own philosophy about first person writing and um i've gotten pushed back in that case but i most of the uh if 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 any first person is being taken out of my writing it's actually by me because i sometimes feel like i overindulge and there's I... no um my, my editor is very good at at um highlighting instances where i don't need to be in the i'm not adding to the scene. I'm not bringing a connection to the reader that is important. You know, it'd be just like, so I called the person up. She's like, I don't need to know that you picked up the phone. I don't, I don't, we I don't see, need to yeah. just cross it. Textual. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, I think there's places where it it it, uh, it works and is good and, and it makes it better. And then there's places where it's just intrusive and unnecessary. So I try to police it myself, but I also have an editor who's good at highlighting those indulgent moments I, yeah i i love those i have good editors i have a good agent too and she says when i go too far i'm i'm going purple and i don't know why but i completely understand what she means um yeah. as another chloe rogers says i think it's nice that death is being talked about more and it's making people think about their options even though the circumstances that make us talk haven't been ideal and i i have to agree with that um yeah. i've uh accidentally become a death expert as a result of doing all this research and i've gotten I've done a lot of interviews for like New York Times and other places where people are asking what what do we do with this amount of with, with this enormous the enormity of loss that has happened after the COVID-19 yeah. pandemic. 
Um, yeah. what, how do you, you know, do you sort of feel that that's related uh, to our inability to kind of, you know, hit it head on or? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, you know, I think that the, the overwhelming numbers um, and just this, the, the, the image of refrigerated trucks just driving around was kind of haunting to me, just this, um, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what the answer is. Uh, I, I think it, it's a, it, for me, it, it, death is always, it's a very personal, you know, yeah. death and loss are so personal that it's hard to say what the effect is on a culture. Right. I always tell people there's no wrong way to grieve as long as you're you're doing it. You know, you yeah. can't mess it up. Like, it's OK. You yeah. can't mess it up. Um, uh, let's see. Marini Lynn says, wanted to say I consider myself incapable of understanding anything science related, but she's read all of your books and understands them really well. And I agree. You have a wonderful way of uh, <laughs> your method of writing really brings things down to people so that we get it and we don't have to be experts to get it. I think that's wonderful. And I think it's very easy for me to do because I'm not an expert and I'm coming in at exactly the same level as you. <laughs> so I know if uh, um, I mean, I, I there's no no concern that it's going to be too complicated because I don't I don't get it at that level. So, mm -hmm. to, you know, I'm, I'm um, th but thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. I was just looking. Uh, Kendra Reed says uh, when you were researching for spook, you took a psychic seminar. Are you still waiting to develop or are you have you have you, have you gotten any uh, special <laughs> skills there? <laughs> no, I am still hopelessly uh, inept as a as a medium. Uh, I was a it was a it was the Arthur Arthur Findlay College in in England out in the hinterlands of England and uh, it was a three day course on how to be a medium and I I would just absolutely failed um, and somebody at one point we were doing some we were all sitting in a circle and you're supposed to see everybody's aura and this guy goes well yeah I could see your aura saying me I could see your aura and it's gray oh. <laughs> That is the nastiest thing. <laughs> Your aura looks sad. <laughs> maybe there are gray auras. I always just picture them kind of rainbow hued. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe gray is good. Maybe that means you're. Uh, it's like you know, black is all colors, not no color, or something like that. I feel like we could spin this in a positive way. <laughs> yeah, let's um, do that, Brandy. <laughs> many thanks to Chelsea Hunt, who says she loves Mr. Humble and Dr. Butcher. Thank you. Uh, yes. Uh, Mary actually tweeted about that. I really appreciate that. Hearing a lot of messages on here, yes, you guys can send me messages on Peculiar Book Club uh, Twitter. I will be around there. Um, I think I missed the first one in the series, but Camilla Nichols says debating DDD15. Um, what is that? Do I do you know what that is, Mary? I do I think not. I missed the first part of the question. I don't know what that is. Have to hop in here and tell me. Um, I will say, Brandy, we should talk about. Um, head transplants because that that is something in stiff and the you know the uh i i called you when i wrote the epilogue to that's right. the book so you're the expert there but i think people might be curious because when we left off it was well i i it was just me having spoken to dr white and you picked up the baton there and I told me everything you'd ever need to know about um head transplants i.e whole body transplants right. uh, and and Dr. White himself, who turns out to be a far more interesting person than I might uh, than I was able to appreciate having just lunched with him one day. Yeah, he was he was um, possibly more interesting to research than to than to know as a person. It's possible. Um, I do think that one of the unusual things about head transplants is that they work and we could do them right now. Um, so I, I, mean, I hate to let the cat out of the bag, but we could actually do head transplant, body transplant tomorrow if you had you know the important things like a willing victim i mean patient um <laughs> a, a, a body donor money and permission four kind of important things um but it is possible to do this it's just right, right, why right. would anybody really want to and right. if you did you'd yeah, still be yeah. you which is well also you would be paralyzed basically and yeah mightily immunosuppressed I mean, your quality of life would not be stellar. Let's just say. <laughs> yeah, um, it would. It would. You wouldn't enjoy your time, uh, actually, and uh, and and it gets a lot of reac reactions because there there's a place in the book where I talk about a paralyzed person saying they want the surgery because their organs are failing, and that makes you look at it differently yes. than 
than you do when it's just Dr. White, exactly. which brings me to Sarah McMullen's question. I apologize for anyone whose name I've butchered, by the way. Uh, Skilache is my last name and I've been called Shoelace for years, so I'm very sorry. Um, but she asks, have there been, what are the sort of different cultural um, responses to works like yours and mine? So I wonder if you wanted to give an answer to that one. Oh, you know, I don't get a lot of feedback from uh, from other, well, I, I mentioned the reaction of the reviewer in uh, London. <laughs> so um, not a great reception from him. Um, I, I'll say it has, Stiff has been, it's been translated into, I don't know, 15 or 20 languages. Wow. Or, or maybe more, but um, not in, uh, not in South, not in South America at, at all. Um, Asia, most countries in Asia, including Indonesia, um, and, and a lot of Europe, but not South America. So I'm having to infer what people, either there just is less interest or it, maybe the publishers thought that it was too weird or offensive if they're Catholic or I don't, I'm not sure what, or maybe it's just that my foreign rights agent has no contacts <laughs> in those places. So I don't, I don't really know um, what that, what that means. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, I think in terms of cultural responses to mine, um, I, I, part of the book, Mr. Humble, Dr. Butcher deals with some really scary sounding animal experiments and, uh, will have asked me, you know, what kind of responses do I get from that? Well, I just went to the Bushwick Book Club. Uh, so this is a peculiar book club. If you don't know about the Bushwick Book Club, you should look them up. That's where they choose an author's text and then invite a bunch of artists, songwriters, chefs, and drink mixologists and dance people to do creative works based on the book that you have written. And then sitting in front of that and watching that perform for you is very interesting. Wow, but, um, cool. but some of the songs were very much like, oh my God, why are you doing this to monkeys? And um, and I can only agree. I, I did my best not to take sides, but I do think that you have you have the idea that performing experiments helps people, and we're glad. And then you have the idea that do you really need three hundred frozen monkey heads in your freezer? Probably not. So it's it's a difficult um, as our nearest evolutionary relative, especially primates, makes that you know. I, me personally, I had to watch videos of the surgeries. And they're in color and it's very disturbing stuff. And so trying to treat that with delicacy is important. And I've long since lost who, uh, oh no, it's Anna Luisa had said to you, Mary, that she really appreciated the mix of compassion, humor, and education that came with Stiff. And uh, and I think that that's a big part of yes, helping yeah. lots of different people respond appropriately to work. Yes, I think so, I think so too. I, I wrote that book with a very um, powerful sense of unease that, um, I didn't want I didn't want to offend anyone who might have just lost somebody. I wanted to be myself, and I'm a little bit flippant I'm, and I'm a little gross, but I didn't I, I didn't want to. I didn't you know I, 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 the thought of somebody reading and, and being upset or feeling um, mm -hmm. yeah I, that that so I I was very nervous when the book came out. Like I, I didn't know if I got it right. So uh, all you can do really as an author is stress about it a lot and do. Right. Your, um, I think you know you have to be true to yourself, but you also have to think about your your audience and what they yeah. may what their reality might be. You know, my mm -hmm. sister in law had just lost her husband around the time the book came out, and she's like, "Yeah, congratulations! I'm never going to be reading that book." And she yeah. read that book, and I'm born her. You know, it just was the timing was terrible, and mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I don't. I think if she read it, it probably is not what she assumed that it was. Um, right. But nonetheless, yeah. Yeah, I can see I can see that. Um, Elizabeth Witten asks, uh, I'm a journalist. I've thought about moving into writing books, and I know that, that that's kind of your angle as well, Mary. She she asks advice, you know, how do you start? Um, start an article and then try. Yeah, um, I, that's a good way to do it, to um, to, to start with, a, for two reasons. Number one, <clears throat> you, if you publish an article and it seems like it's bigger bigger than the space that you had uh you'll probably hear from an agent you know if if, you, if it's a you know in, in the new york times or in you know some some fairly uh, um well-known mm -hmm. place agents check um you, you know you you often people get overtures from an agent saying would you like to explore this in a book so that is a really nice way to connect with an yes. agent and that's what happened with me uh, the agent contacted me after the piece ran on salon it was just a short piece maybe a thousand words um, so that is a good way to do it. And it's also, um, it's also a nice way to 
explore whether or not it's a topic you really do want to write about. Um, I mean, a book proposal is also a way to do that, but a, um, a book proposal can be a little bit more of an investment in time. Um, so, a, so an article is a good way to explore it. You might get to the end of it and say, good, done, all I want to do on that. I'm done, moving on. Um, or you might just, you might be completely fascinated and think I need to say more and I want to do more. So I think that's a, that's a really good way, uh, whether it's a, a blog, an article, a podcast. I mean, there's lots of smaller ways to start looking into it and then, you know, gradually kind of baby steps, which for me, uh, having never written anything longer than 6,000 words, I kind of needed <laughs> baby steps. It was a little, a little daunting for me. Yeah, I don't know. That doesn't sound like baby steps. That sounds like a, a big leap there. Um, but I, I totally agree with you. I, I have to confess, my my book, Death Summer Coat, was originally an article. Actually, it was originally a review that I'd written about green burial practices in England. Okay. And I had written quite an extensive article for uh, Huffington Post. And I wasn't contacted by an agent. I was contacted by a publisher. Uh -huh. I didn't have an agent yet. And I just, I, I know some other authors. And that's another thing I would say is knowing other authors, making a community of people yes. around you really helps. Mm -hmm. uh, so I contacted them and managed to get an agent. And then actually the publisher that originally contacted me didn't take the book, um, which sometimes happens. But yeah. it was my way in. And I think, uh, don't be afraid to write articles. Um, just pitch. The, the worst they can do is say no. Yeah, um, I think it's also true. I mean, the, the other thing, what you you know, what you said about a community of writers. Um, at the time, I was in a community of, of a dozen or so writers called the Grotto, and um, we had this little tradition of on New Year's making predictions for other people. There were a few of us that would have lunch, and we'd make predictions about other people behind their backs. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody made a prediction about me, which was that I'd have a book deal by the next New Year's Day. So around October, I was like, oh, shit, I have to, I've got to write a book proposal. I mean, you kind of, uh, but but being around other writers, uh, it just showed me this is this is doable. I see all yeah. these people doing it. And until that point, it had seemed so large and so daunting. Mm -hmm. And I didn't even know how to begin. Uh, but seeing everybody around me doing it and um, how it's done. Uh, yeah, just, just, I mean, you don't have to share office space with them, but just having some, some contacts in that world, it, uh, kind of demystifies the process, and it's also inspiring and and makes right. it even, uh, doable. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm going to end with this last question. Of we're not done with the show yet, guys, but we're gonna uh, we're gonna switch over and do something a little bit new. But one person did ask, "What's your favorite writing beverage? Your favorite writing drink?" Um, I just lost the track of who it was that asked. Oh, okay. The alcoholic or caffeinated? Oh, let's talk about both. Okay. Uh, well, uh. Coffee, coffee, good coffee uh, is um, very, very important. It's got to be there in the morning. Really good, fresh ground, <laughs> whole bean, fresh ground uh, cup of coffee is critical. It is absolutely critical. Um, I like it. Um, and then I sometimes um, I have a friend who uh, she's a novelist and she's well, she doesn't live across the street anymore, but we she'd come over and we'd sit on the couch together and we'd both have I would have a martini. <laughs> And she had, I can't remember what she had, maybe a Manhattan. And we would just sit there and work. Yeah. It was, it was great. It, I actually keep a bottle of Writer's Tears whiskey in my in my writing cave. Just Writer's like, Tears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yes. French yeah. press, pour over, drip yeah. coffee. What's your pour over? Yes, pour oh, over. Pour over. Very nice. Very oh, yeah. nice. Well, we're going to take a quick pause from our question and answer period because it is time for the pop culture quizzer with Davey Barris. Welcome, hey. Davey. Take hey, everybody. Away. Thanks for having me come back in. I actually I have a question for Mary, if you don't mind, before we launch in all the pop culture stuff. Mary, I noticed that you, in your writing, uh, the human side of everything comes out, whether it's the people you're talking to. Is that just your your natural inclination is that cadavers can't give you good quotes. Like, you know, <laughs> how did you end up focusing so much on the people that you were around? Oh, it's cause, cause they, uh, in all of my books, but in stiff in particular, they were, they were all just so interesting and, and fun. And it just happens naturally. Um, and, and, and yeah, like you said, the, you know, cadavers are not very quotable. <laughs> um, so yeah, they're they're the, my books are 
ultimately about people. Uh, and people are really, really interesting. Yeah. Usually. That's, yeah. Yeah. I think that's why we're doing the show, isn't it? Yeah. All these uh, people who are with us are interesting. Peculiar. Yes. They're all very interesting. Yes. yes. All the yep. most interesting people right here. There's right been a here. great great conversation going on. They figured out what the, the DDD conference is. It is oh, good. the oh, death boy, death death death. disaster. Yeah, death. Uh go ahead, type it in the chat one more time for me, everybody. Uh death <laughs> something, and uh it's a conference in England, and people are actually connecting in our chat from this. I'm so excited. From past. So people are we've brought people together today. Yes. Now um, we all need the same t-shirt, which you can get. <laughs> Go, Davey, um, go. So, yeah. So, I've got some pop culture things to bring in here for everybody. And uh, bear with me because I have so many tabs open. Uh, Mary, your book is actually, your book covers so much ground that, I mean, I could have gone anywhere from Six Feet Under to Hannibal Lecter to um, CSI and all these TV shows, Law and Order. Uh, it did, uh, there was an episode of Bones that stood out to me where they actually go to a decomposition farm. Oh, yeah. And there's an actual murder victim that was hidden at the decomposition farm, and they have to solve the case. And uh, you learn all about it. It's actually a great, if you ever want to, like, you know a visual representation of it. You know what? Somebody did, one of, the, one of the reasons that there is a body farm is that some murderer hid his victim in a grave on top of the actual body. Oh. So, you know, who like, who would think to look there? Uh, anyway, so uh, but that that part that case helped inspire because they thought, oh, they, they they misread the body and thought that it had been there a long time. In fact, it was a fresh, it was fairly fresh, okay. fresh, and uh, yeah. So that's that's sort of close to the truth. That may have been inspiration for that. Excellent, and I love the conversation earlier. I almost jumped in where you were talking about the uh, the human heads living on and Futurama which is an adult animation cartoon did a great job of <laughs> using this as a device to bring back celebrities from our current time but they imagine a world where all celebrities heads were kept alive in jars <laughs> and they, they just lived on there was a hall of presidents and they just lived their lives as heads in jars and got to keep thinking well, they, and talking well, they meaning to decant it doesn't it <laughs> there are so many areas that we could uh, that we could go over um, but I did want to talk about actual cadavers and actual dead bodies and their connection to movies, because there are some famous movies that have used dead bodies on set in, in the production. And one of the most famous is, and the movie became cursed, they think because of it is Poltergeist. And uh, they use several dead bodies um, in some of the final scenes, including a scene in a pool where what? someone was actually swimming and uh, the uh, they there are many deaths and mishaps that are tied to the movie Poltergeist, and they think that it's a curse from the you know the prop master's decision to use real dead bodies. Okay, question. Uh, yes. Hang on. So you're saying somebody drowned in the pool, and the director's like, "Keep the camera on." <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, uh, so. Someone was trying to escape at the end of the movie, found themselves in the pool, and a dead body arose from the water. So, uh, Got yeah. it. without okay. giving away too many spoilers for the movie Poltergeist, okay. yeah. So, no, 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 no. Okay. Uh, but yeah, some some mishaps did occur because of the curse. Um, the movie Apocalypse Now, which is a very intense movie, yes. the uh, the prop master thought that uh, to make it more intense and more real for the actors on set. They thought it'd be a good idea to hide dead bodies and dead body parts around the set and around uh, the area where everyone ate no. so that the stench of death, the feel of death was in the air. This was something Coppola did? Yeah, well, it, I don't know who exactly is responsible for it, whether it's the prop person or yeah, but the entire cast and crew were arrested because of it. Um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> so they were held for a day because of it. And uh, the last one I wanted to mention was um, Dawn of the Dead. Uh, their prop master thought that they were buying a prop dead body, a prop skeleton. But it turns oh, no. out after the props were sold at auction, someone did an autopsy and revealed that, in fact, it was a real skeleton of a real person that they were Whoa. using. Oh, no, but they so, didn't know? But they, well, they claim they didn't know. They claim uh, that they the didn't catch. know. Yeah. Well, so, 
Oh, you know, who knows? Maybe we'll have to dig into the real story behind oh. that. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so that's some of our uh, some of our pop culture connections and uh, the game I want to play uh, with Mary is what I'm calling the corpse quiz. So <laughs> I found an article of some of the most famous corpses that are preserved that you could you could go visit these corpses. Oh, okay. Uh, Right. They've either been held for science or for other reasons. So I want to see if you can guess which okay. one of these people. So we'll start with question number one. All right. Uh, this corpse was an Egyptian pharaoh, but died before his 20th birthday and only stood five and a half feet tall. Was it Ramses II, <laughs> King Tut, or uh, Imhotep? Okay. Well, Tut obviously is one of them, right? Yes, uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce the, the full thought, name, but B is King Tut. Tutankhamun. It's going to come down to like a height issue. Like, nope, there was Tut, but he was five feet. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Like a quarter of an inch. So is King Tut? Yes, that is correct. It, it is B, Woo! King Tut. Yes. All right. All right. Question two. Yeah, these aren't these aren't two. These aren't true. I'm not trying to trip you up here. Um, this former Soviet Union oh. leader's corpse lies in a glass sarcophagus in its mausoleum on the Red Square. Was it A. Vladimir Lenin, uh, B. Joseph Stalin, or C. Boris Yeltsin? Uh, it's Lenin, and I have seen that guy. I have seen him. He's it, basically waxed by now. I mean, it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it's a really surreal and fabulous experience that I highly recommend if you're ever in Red Square. <laughs> it is. There I is was, a somehow. I missed that. I, I was I was on the hunt for brain slices of Lenin instead, or Stalin. Now I forget who. Someone's brain slices. Oh, right. Well, this article this article claims there is a, a team of five or six scientists whose full time job is to preserve his corpse. And then our last corpse quiz question: This corpse is the oldest mummy ever found. It was discovered in a glacier in the Alps in 1991 with an arrowhead in their shoulder. Was it A, the Inca Ice Maiden, B, the Soap Lady, or C, Atsi, the Ice Man? Oh, totally Atsi. That is correct. Yeah. That is correct. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they're the still trying lady. to figure He's out. Uh, <laughs> might be the oldest murder discovered, too, with that arrowhead. <laughs> I know, yeah. In his yeah shoulder. Soap lady, the Soap Lady is in the Murder Museum, right? She is. Yeah, I've <laughs> seen her. She's uh, soapy. She's soapy, um, <laughs> among other yeah. things. <laughs> the, the, the other two, the Inca Ice Maiden, is also a very famous cadaver that's been discovered and preserved. So congratulations. Oh, perfect, right. perfect score on the corpse quiz. Yeah, thank you. I thought you were going to ask about Jeremy Bentham. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, he's popped up a, a couple of times over here in the uh, in the tweets. Would love to meet old Bentham someday, says Camille, Nichol, uh, Camilla Nichols. And um, a couple other people were asking about it, too. Um Let's see. You know, I live in Cleveland, and you can actually go see the coffin, and he's in there. He's just not on display of President Garfield, if oh, if you that, want to. <laughs> Garfield has a cameo in one of my later books for uh, he was um, rectally fed. Yes, which does not work, as it turns out. Not very well. You can get no. a little bit of a nutrient that way. But um, anyway, but his doctor kind of had recipes for rectal feeding. <laughs> yeah. You know. They read like baby food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually saw an article on, uh, I can't remember if it was, I mean, this was recent. It might have been on Salon. I can't remember where I saw it, but they were basically saying why you can't feed someone through the rectum. And I was like, are we still doing that? Who's doing that now? So. No, I mean, it, it only as a measure of okay. her last resort. Yeah. Yes, he did die from bad medicine, Camilla says. And yes, <laughs> uh, Kesa B, Kesa says, uh, cooking with Mary Roach. <laughs> I like that. Totally. Um, don't get any ideas, Brandy. I know you're right. Uh, <laughs> um, okay, and we still have Burke, Burke Skeleton doing time for his, uh, that's the first yeah. year murders there. Yep, yep. And there was a, uh, apparently there's a, a wallet made from his hide somewhere. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, he was dissected as punishment. Yeah, which, so and a punishment fits the crime kind of scenario. If you guys don't know who he is, Burke and Hare, uh, they they realize that a quicker way to sell bodies to science um, would be to just kill them first so that you had a nice fresh body to- uh, Instead of digging to them up, which is, you know, honestly hard yeah. work. It is hard work, it actually is. I, I did an extensive <laughs> amount of, of research on this and I was on Mysteries of the Museum talking about this. Um, and while I was on it, this is for the, the Travel Channel, at one point, I suppose for effect, they zoomed in just on my eye. 
this is like HD TV. I mean, it's not an attractive thing to have your eye that large on a screen, but I, you know, so there's a claim to fame. My eye was a whole television screen for Mysteries at the Museum. Um, thank you, Davey. That was wonderful. And Mary, you did a great job. Absolutely. Thank you. I'm glad I was able to add that pop culture stuff. In. And I just want to add that the bodies from Apocalypse Now were sold to them from Grave Robbers to tie it all back together. Wow. Yep. Oh, that's a I love it. This is, you know, I'm going to have to watch that movie with fresh eyes now. Mm -hmm. uh, my own. No, I mean, not anyone else's. <laughs> um, oh, Horrible History's got a mention on here. Um, some of you may have noticed uh, the Charming Disaster has actually popped up a couple times in the feed. Charming Disaster is not only uh, has been sort of highlighting our T-shirt, on Twitter this week, but they are responsible for our wonderful theme music. And at least one of you won a CD as our part of our swag uh, giveaway during the the sign up. And I know another person won. Oh, yes. Oh, hello. There they are. Another person won um, a signed book from Mary. Well, we do have one more giveaway today, and that giveaway is going to be a little bit of swag from our merch shop, which I've been told is not easy enough to find. I apologize. All of uh, Peculiar Book Club stuff lives on my website, so you can go to my website, uh, brandyskilache.com backslash peculiar, and there is a little um, button, a little store button, which I have not made large enough, and you can get to our swag there. But today we do have somebody who is winning that swag, and we pre-picked a number uh, out of a hat, and we not this one, but another one. And Davey, do you want to give me that name? Sure, that sure, name that. was Kendra Reed. Kendra Reed. Kendra Reed, who just wrote, I love horrible histories. My kids are huge fans too, LOL. You are our winner of the swag. So yes, congratulations. And all you have to do is uh, send me a tweet and we'll DM and I will figure out the proper way to get that swag to you. You have your choice of t-shirt, book tote, or coffee mug, um, which normally I have here to show you, but I forgot. So uh, so you get that, congratulations. Um, and those of you who are uh, a big fan of the song, which we'll be playing again as we leave the show today, that is on an album called Spells and Rituals, I think, I hope. Um, and uh, there's also a new album that's gonna be coming out by Charming Disaster in the future. And it is about Mary Curie and it's called Our Lady of Radium. So those peculiar folks who love our peculiar books are gonna love this too. Um, oh, Thing has brought me the, uh, so here we go. This is the Peculiar Book Club mug. It's it's nicely, um, I'm going the wrong way. It's black on the inside, like my heart. Um, so <coughs> you can have that. Oh, yeah, that's, sorry. Thank you, Davey. Ta-da! Black. I just want to remind all of you before we do our final, final sign off with Mary Roach that our next event is July 8th and it is with Lindsay Fitzharris and the butchering art. So who super excited about that. Um, we've already sold out of half the tickets. So if you're interested in coming to that event, get on that quick. We've got some giveaways for that as well. Um, several people are writing in the stream that they are excited and looking forward to Fuzz, which is Mary Roach's next book. And we will be having her back on for season two to talk about that one. Um, Re-release date for Stiff. Um, I think it might be coming out in August. In August, okay, good. So I, I am not sure, but I think so. All right. Well, that is something you guys can look forward to. Please do sign up to our uh, YouTube list, our mailing list. Come to our next show with the Butchering Art. Thank you, Mary, for being here. And thank all we of do you, have, we do my have darling Brandy, peculiars. We hmm? do have all the, the book information for Mary. Oh, we do. Yes, we do. Sorry. Here it is. All the good stuff. Places it is available, the local bookshops as well as bookshop.org. And the paperback will be available at Amazon.com. Thank you everyone for being here don't forget that when you come to peculiar book club you are among friends because if you're weird you're family <laughs>